Okay, so let's start with a simple question. Uh, what do you think privacy, what role does privacy play in the current day and age of hacks and security threats? Where does privacy come in? What is its state? I, all right, so I'll go first because I like to talk. <laughs> um, well, privacy, privacy makes a lot of sense uh, in that you don't have any anymore. And most of you have willingly given it up in, just to make sure that you don't have to pay for anything. So any of the, any of the websites out there where um, you don't pay anything for, but you get a lot of value out of, uh, you're not the customer. Um, you're the one being sold. Uh, and we end up giving a lot of that information away um, all the time. So, that's something. How many people in this room have heard of Tor before? I just want to know how much to explain. Okay, a couple of you. Thanks. Uh, I think that the general people at Tor also have the same narrative that Andrew has, which is that there are these evil corporations or governments that want to spy on you and you're this poor victim on the internet and all this is being stolen about you. And while that is true and there are people who do want to benefit from your data, I don't necessarily think that is the fairest story. I think that when the internet was created, it was for a bunch of researchers that just wanted to share files together. They all trusted each other. So when you send someone a message and it can be intercepted, it can be spied upon, it can be traced back to you, you can leak all sorts of data about you in ways that you didn't expect your metadata. It's not actually doing anything that it wasn't intended to do. The internet is working as it was designed, which is not designed for security, and I think that is the problem. Uh, Tor, on the other hand, because we use encryption, it provides you security, privacy, anti-fingerprinting, anti-tracking, and I think it's important to actually take matters into your own hands. I think it's also unrealistic to say that you can't use the internet because you never get anything done. I think it's unrealistic to say, hey, I'm not going to use Facebook because they keep some of my data because everyone is using it. And I work for Tor, who keeps people anonymous, and I still use things that aren't open source, and I still use things that take all my data. But I think it's all about being aware of when you are sending your data, and if you don't want that to happen to you, there are solutions, and Tor is just one of many solutions. I'm not saying you have to use that either. So, just being aware of what the internet was made to do, what it's not made to do, and being aware of the security tools you can use, I think it's a great step. Yeah, to me, to echo your points, uh, yeah, if you're using something free, you are the product. So, you are the product. But, um, one of my issues I have is who reads the privacy notices that you get that are 15 pages long? <laughs> yeah, I have, to sleep. I have to sleep sometimes. Yeah. I mean, seriously, there's got to be a level of expectation that for the general user, you have to make privacy easy, like understand what you are actually giving up versus saying, yeah, cover your butt and here, read and agree to this 15 page document. I don't think that's really realistic. Um, and I had another great point, but it's skipping my mind right now, so I'll pass it on to Andrew. Yeah, and I just kind of, to touch more on what you were talking about, we are all paying a price for everything that we use. Every single product we pay for one way or the other. So you either pay for it by giving away that information, which then they monetize to someone else, or we physically pay the $5 a month to not have that opportunity, or sometimes they do both. So I think knowing that going in and looking at it from that standpoint, I'm willing to give this up for that amount is a really good way to look at it. And, and I'm sorry, I just, the one point that I forgot was um, when we present our private information to a company and maybe we agree, we read the document, we agree that, okay, I'm willing to share my information with you. Our expectation is that they will protect that information and that has proven to be inaccurate, inaccurate in so many cases. First point to do is that, yes, actually we agree, but no one knows what he agrees with. I mean, it's, it's so much information and you just, yes. it's not uh, summarized. Yes. You agree to this and that and that. You just have a lot of things. And even when, when you have a software update for something, you have Facebook releases some updates uh, with the privacy and you have to read it and accept it. Who does it? Yes. No one does it. You just like, click accept and they can do whatever 
they want with this information. And something more interesting, you agree to a digital document. But who says that this document cannot be modified after that? After you have clicked, I agree, because you don't have written signature, you just have a checkbox and you click, yes, I agree. But this form is submitted into their server and it remains over there. You don't have the form. Tomorrow they can have another form and they can say, oh, you, you just uh, clicked on this form. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, that was exactly my point. Yeah, it's a 15 page document. Nobody's realistically going to read that. I remember once when Google released a new updated uh, privacy notice, there was a sentence about modifying images, and people went crazy about it. They thought that part of their face was going to be put on, let's say, some other image or something like this. And then at the end, it turned out that if Google wants to resize your image, it's modified, so they had to put it anyway. But this is the level of understanding the public has and the lawyers, I mean, the text itself as to the impact. You said, uh, you said Google. Does somebody know what happens when you actually click that you want to, to have your image deleted from, a Facebook, from Facebook or from a Google server? You actually don't have the image deleted because they have thousands of, okay, a few of our hips of your image, they just delete the indexing. So still you cannot, you cannot completely delete your information, whatever, doesn't matter if it's an image or a document. Everything on the internet is forever. Yeah, no, I don't need that thing. <laughs> okay, Linda wants to say a few words. While I agree with everyone, I do think that it's important to not make the user feel stupid for not reading the 15-page document because it's not intended for you to read. And I also think that while this is really terrible, it's not really realistic to opt out of any of these services. I think that you can stop using Google and all social media, but I think that the social consequences are so high that people aren't actually willing to do this, and that's okay. I don't think it's necessarily all on the user's end of the deal to make this an okay situation. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the public, from the crowd? Yeah, over there, microphone please. Please. Hello, thank you for being here. My question is related to what you are discussing, but uh, as a developers, uh, should we read uh, the big documents uh, in the title of the discussion? Uh, there is a document called GDPR. As an ordinary developers, do we need to read this? Because this document is, uh, in my opinion, targeted for mainly uh, guys who deal with business processes and probably system architects. How this document translates to the ordinary developer? How, how this document will affect our work? Please. It's a, actually, the issue with this document is that even if you read it, there are no technical specifications which can help you to, to make the information more secure. Yeah, it says the information should be crypto cri cryptography protected, but no one says how uh, you should use this algorithm and that method to protect the, the information. So even if you read it, it will not be really useful for you as a developer. That, that's my personal opinion. And uh, actually, I consider it a huge problem that there are no strict technical specifications with GDPR and other directives as well, even, even ISO. It just says you have to have your information locked, you have to, to, to have uh, encryption, strong encryption, uh, the strong passwords. Nobody is saying you need to have the numbers, uh, big capitals, little capitals. They just say you need to have a strong password. Okay, I consider that I have a strong password. Who is going to argue with this? Well, just for our foreign speakers, GDPR is an European law that mandates. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because we kind of run into the same thing with PCI compliance. And PCI states that you have to securely store credit cards. And so you can be PCI compliant until you get hacked and you lost those credit cards and therefore you were PCI compliant. 
So it's not like this is what we need to do to protect it and then you'll be okay. It's like you should really be doing these things and then if you don't, then there's obvious consequences. Who here uses Wi-Fi? <laughs> Who here thinks it's secure? I think the last three days have shown that it's not. We're basically running against a race of a bunch of, uh, um, to, to talk, to reference my, my current president says, um, overweight, slovenly hackers um, designed, you know, designed to hack everything. Whoever hacked WPA2 has just put a thorn into ev what everybody thought. And if you aren't using SSL, and you aren't using uh, a VPN whenever you're on an unsecure Wi-Fi network, you're basically asking to get hacked. And the issue with PCI compliance and the European equivalent is it's crap. It doesn't make any sense. Nobody, nobody follows it to the letter. And I have seen companies that were PCI compliant that I could, I could drive a truck through their security within moments. The problem, the problem is that it, it's, hard, it's a hard thing to do. And unless you have people that are very keyed in and understand the mind of how somebody like a hacker works, and a lot of you are that kind of mind. That's why you're, that's why you're in this industry. That's why you like to develop software. Um, but it takes a certain mind to think of all the different nooks and crannies that somebody can fall into. Should you read it? I don't know. I think that's up to your job description. But should you follow it? Probably. Right. So I think that uh, overall, I'm not a fan of the document in the sense that it doesn't make sense. I'm a fan that it exists because some countries don't even care and it holds some amount of accountability to give you what I would personally do, since I did used to develop stuff. I think that you should just ask for the least amount of information and the least amount of privilege as possible and try to use uh, trusted libraries to safely encrypt everything when you can. I think you make mistakes when you try to make your own crypto. It's really hard. I think that if you ask for all the permissions you can so you don't have to keep interrupting people, that's good. But what if your application can access camera, sound, internal files, and you don't need all of that? Then you have that data and you're required to protect that data. So if you can just think ahead of time what information you need and what amount of permissions you can get, I think just minimizing the damage is what I would recommend because while you can try to write the most secure you can, code you can. I think it's an asymmetrical battle. There's millions of lines of code, and if there's one insecure line, someone could exploit that while you have to secure a million lines of code. It's just not a very feasible thing to do, and even if you do it, you're gonna have to update your code. So I personally just try to have systems that are secure, use languages that are secure, at least for the least amount of information and the least amount of privileges. So that's what I would do. The loss is kind of like eh. For me, if you want to read it, I think it's a great thing. What I would object to is if it's pushed onto you as a responsibility, because it should be interpreted for you for, into requirements level that you can implement. That's what needs to happen with that. To give you this big manual and say, oh, by the way, interpret it, make your own requirements out of this, I think that's a great disservice. Um, regarding some of the points the others have made, about like PCI and these other standards and how they're not prescriptive. I think to try to do prescriptive things that apply to every single organization using every single type of technology would be an absolute train wreck because you can't do that. There's too many special cases. So I think we're forced to deal with these generalities. And then uh, to the point that, uh, yeah, PCI has a standard and these other standards that are being out there. Um, you can drive a truck through them. Yes, that's true, um, but we want to see a minimum bar, and that's what it does. It establishes a minimum level of threshold. Unfortunately, a lot of organizations set that as the bar you must meet, and that's all you ever do, and I completely disagree with that. But it brings so many organizations to at least a minimum level, and I think that helps us all. Yeah, I was just going to say, the... Uh, Less important is reading that document 
and understanding what it says, and more important is what industry standards and best practices can be applied to meet those standards. So if you're actually talking about data storage or we're talking about passwords, right? For the longest time, passwords is, it has to be three out of the four character types, you know, upper, lower numbers and things like that. And in the last few months, most of the standards have changed to we shouldn't do that anymore. You know, no more max links, no more min links, we should have a passphrase. And so a lot of that has changed. And to Steve's point, if we're going to go and try to update all those documents, first of all, think about who's writing those documents. And do we actually want that level of technical to be forced upon us? So, but understanding what they're trying to accomplish with that document and how I can properly store, protect, transmit that data is really what's important. Thank you for all the answers. Uh, I think we have a little bit of time left, so I want to touch on the other topics mentioned in the discussion. So I know most of the audience is developers, uh, so I want to ask the speakers what do they think, what, will I, AI replace developers in the near future? No, your job is safe. You can sleep well tonight. Honestly, I don't see AI changing the role of the developer that much. It may change how we develop and the kinds of applications that we develop, but those applications are still going to have to exist. They're still going to have to be business applications. There's still going to be custom requirements that I don't see spending all the time to build an AI model and a neural net around to actually get the machine to the point where it understands the business when we can write a simple e-commerce website, those things. So I don't think the role of the developer will change, will move so much as it'll just change. We'll be doing different kinds of things with newer, better languages. I also don't know if anyone works in AI currently. Does anyone? Okay, a couple hands. And if you know, if you've been working with this, you know that it's not magic, it's just math. And you can't even get it to do some really simple things. I'm not saying that it won't ever get to the point where it will get to do sophisticated things, but two things come to my mind. A friend of mine who does research on Princeton found that since uh, artificial intelligence is largely based on human data, it makes as much errors as a human when it's making certain judgments. So if it was asked to pick a certain applicant for the job, it would still prefer males because all of the data that it's given input has that bias. I think that if, because of that reason, I think we still need people to supervise the data. I think we still need people to give input into AI models. And for really complex tasks that are organic, like trying to get a robot to walk, it's really hard for AI to learn, but if you let it try, have the human tell it what went wrong, and have it try again, that kind of feedback loop speeds it up exponentially, and it's actually resulted in one of the most sophisticated walking robots around. So I think that we need to learn how to work with it, and we need to also just be careful of how and where it is implemented, and make sure we take all those additional considerations into account. And I agree, I don't think it's going to get, I think there's a lot of hype saying, oh, robots are going to replace us. I think it's so far away, in my opinion, but that's just my opinion. Um, to me, it, it's, uh, will, I think of like a hole digger. Did a backhoe replace the hole digger? Well, this hole digger still exists. People who dig holes, but they use the backhoes to do it. And to me, it's like a tool that's going to be used, but they're going to be able to do so much more with the help of AI. And there may be fewer developers, I would give that. You know, some of the development work that is somewhat routine and pretty basic, AI may be able to do that, but you can have people using AI as a tool to develop much more better and complex applications. Well, I basically think that the desired skill level for the developers uh, will be lower than it is currently. Because uh, you said that people are mainly, some of the people are doing just templates and that kind of job will be overridden by their artificial intelligence and the skill level for, for a middle developer will be lowered. Actually, yeah, I think AI is going to take your job. And I think it's a lot earlier than you think it is. Um, so, should you be scared? 
No. But it depends on what your job is. If it's editing HTML templates, or, or some job that you really, really hate doing, and you don't use your brain to do it, are you sad that AI is going to have to do that? That's what we do. We automate things. And that's what AI is going to do. Um, is it going to be a better mousetrap? Is it going to be used to dig deeper holes and better things? Yes. I, I've seen presentations where um, somebody taught an AI how to, not how to walk, but just told it all the rules. And it had it run for days. And it never even told it how to walk. And it started learning how to walk on its own. Not, it was, it was never given any instruction on how to actually use its legs, but it learned how to walk. So should you be scared? Yes. AI is going to take your job. But is the job that you're doing right now something that you really want to be doing or not? And I think it's sooner than you think. And you know, if this was the mid-70s, when they said that AI was going to take your job then, I, I would say no, I think it's, it's, it's pretty far off. But the things that I've seen so far make me believe that um, you, you are still going to make, be able to make a ton of money in this industry. There are a lot of places that need your brain to do it, but it's probably in teaching a computer to do your job for you. So that you can sit on a beach and sit, you know, sit Mai Tais or drink Rakia at night. Thank you for all the answers. I'm kind of partial with Andrew that uh, all this stupid work is going to be replaced definitely. Because out of so many people copy pasting from Stack Overflow and renaming variables, this is already getting replaced. I read it online that they have a bot that can kind of uh, search on Stack Overflow for the problem given and try to accumulate something that works. So if you this can I have that? Yeah, they do. I think from people from Microsoft are working on it. Um, Okay, so we should uh, touch <coughs> the dig digitization. Well, I want... Digitization is, uh, I guess all of you agree, you're, after all software engineers, is a, is a good trend, right? We're replacing manual labor, physical things like paper and data tunnels with uh, with digital data, right, with ones and zeros. Um, but some of, some of it, not everything can be digitalized properly. One of these things is uh, online voting. So I want to get the opinion of uh, online voting from, from our speakers. What they think about, is it feasible? And if it's not, why not? Online voting, like dig digital voting. Online voting? Yeah. Like for real, for elections, not for Facebook best cake, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really kind of an interesting topic because what we've proven is that physical voting isn't any better. So, I mean, if I'm going to manipulate it, I ought to at least be able to do it from home. Why should I have to go out and actually do it at a voting center? I mean, let's make it easier on the abuser. Just saying. I think the, I think the possible answer here is lying in some weird currency. I think Bitcoin and the blockchain um, might be might be the answer to that. Well, and one problem with with voting is that you shouldn't be able to tell which person voted how, otherwise they can get paid for that. That's why some people that took selfies with the ballot that they're casting, this is illegal in most jurisdictions. And Bitcoin and the crypto is very public. It's very, it's very public, and I think I think uh, Linda can talk about this a little bit because I know she's worked with Zcash a little bit, right? Uh, but uh, I think there's ways around that. And Bitcoin, while it's not anonymous, um, there are other technologies that are based on the blockchain that are. And I think it's not Bitcoin itself. I think the blockchain itself allows us to imprint these things. Into, into the blockchain so that they cannot be changed. Um, and that you can look through them and 
you know, find some way to randomize the data enough that you know that they're accurate and you know uh, that it has not been modified or changed. And it would take a very big state actor to make that happen. So I guess the secret's out of the bag. I also work at Zcash part-time. It's my fun thing to do. And to your question, I think that online voting as my mom would think of it, or if you just ask someone who doesn't work in computers, which means you go to a poll booth and instead of filling out a ticket, you use a computer to click on a button. I think that's way worse. I think that online voting, somehow digitizing voting with zero knowledge proofs, blockchain, uh, shielded addressing that hides your identity, shielded addressing that hides who you're sending it to, and requiring collusion on a computationally global level to even make any changes to the blockchain, I think that has some possibility. But if you were just asking me to choose between paper ballots and computer clicky things, I would go for the paper ballots just because it makes it way easier to systematize the abuse and you can corrupt so many more things and the paper just requires some corrupt people whereas I feel like the there's just so many vectors for attack that I feel like the paper thing, all you really have to do is trust the authorities that are counting it, which maybe you shouldn't. But for the digitization, just click on a computer screen thing, you have to trust that everything has been set up correctly. Everyone before you who's voted didn't tamper with it. No one tried to mess with it, that it counts things accurately, that it doesn't go down. If you just turn off the power in a local area, for example, you can just turn off all the votes. I think it's just not something that we should do in the future, but that we should look at other alternatives. I think that in the future, one way or, or another, we are going for the online voting. However, it doesn't matter how secure it is, it will just happen in, in a few years. But uh, do I know how to stop the corruption at all? No, there will be corruption in, with the online voting and with the physical voting as well. You can, you can have a uh, can use your webcam uh, and they can, st they can still have the same control organs which are checking you on, on the physical voting and still having you checked on the webcam with online voting. And uh, yes, for sure, you have a lot of ways to trick the online voting and yes, you have a lot of freak, a lot of ways to trick the physical voting. So one way or another, it will, it will just happen. And I think that in the future, some smart people will think of better ways how to secure the online voting and will make it at some point even more secure than the physical. Um, I think uh, this digitization is a fad. We'll be going back to analog in a few years. <laughs> um, actually, uh, just joking there. Um, but, uh, you know, it used to be that for me to rob a store, I had to live within about, you know, tens. 15 kilometers of the store, you know. Now, with the internet and things like that, I can sit at home and rob a store easily. And that's the same thing with voting, you know. I'd rather have it be distributed very hard. You need that physical proximity to actually crack it, just because of the importance of the matter. Well, this is a good point uh, that, I would, that I wanted to make, that digitization makes everything better, but at the same time, centralizes all of the work, which makes it also easier to hack, easier to stop. As Linda said, there are power outages. There were bad actors, uh, so would there be a pushback, or at least something to I don't know, counter this um, this negative trend? Because uh, now, let's say in the states, I'm pretty sure most of the power, the utilities, electricity, water, is uh, automated. There is systems, and when they get hacked, they can easily stop the water of the entire state or electricity, which has a huge um, downsides, of course. So. How do, you, how do you see that going in the future? I uh, think that a uh, human can be hacked easily than, uh, than a machine. So, uh, yes, the machines are getting more and more secure, while the people just stay at the same level, at the same security level. So, if you can compromise a uh, machine, why, what will stop you to compromise a person with social engineering or, yeah, with, uh, when you pay him a huge amount of money and you can still make him do what you want. Yeah, but compromising one person in the old world didn't give you power to disrupt an entire state unless you compromise the president or something. Versus with digitization, you compromise the 
IT or the cleaning person who is next to the server and just go plug in a flash drive and you infect the entire government supply system. I still, I still use paper ballots. Now, when, when, I go, when I go to the voting booth and I ask them for a paper ballot, they look at me funny because they're like, the machine is so much easier. I'm like, yeah, 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 I don't care. Just give me the paper ballot. I know what I have, uh, yeah, I know what I've, I've marked in. When I go through airport security, I opt out. Have they told me that it's safe? Sure, but I don't trust them because the TSA in our country can't, could not find a weapon to save their life. Um, and, and I also don't want naked, obscured photos of me all over the internet. I mean, who does? Oh my god, you're the one! Um, I, think, I think digitization does have a backlash. I mean, I still, I still go into the bank and take money. I talk to a teller to get my money out. I just like to know that there's somebody behind it. So, I don't like to digitize everything. Um, I, I, still like to, I still like to call a girl on the telephone when I want to talk to her, instead of texting her endlessly with stupid giffies and, and shit like that. Emojis are great, but if I can get on the phone, it's a lot better. So, perhaps it's because I'm older, uh, but I still long for the days when I can just pick up the phone and, and call, call somebody. I think that to answer your question, is there going to be a backlash? And I don't know if you want digitization of voting to stop, but I don't know if any of you have talked to a politician recently. Have you? I have a friend who's actually married to a judge, and I think the important thing to note is that when he runs for office, he runs for making the state more efficient. He runs for requiring less money to conduct all these matters, including voting. He's not necessarily the most technical person that I know. He's the most technical judge that I know, but have them try to explain what computer security is, how the internet works, how votes are tallied, how do you correct mistakes or ambiguities. It's just that we're having a different conversation. I think that you as a voter, you just want privacy, you don't want, you know, I live in the U.S., maybe you don't want Trump there. You have all these things, but it's just that the people in power are motivated by other factors, and when you tell people, hey, you know, this can really hurt the legitimacy of the vote, and maybe you have to conduct it again, all in paper, maybe you should just do it in paper first. Or if you talk to them about, I guess, how it could benefit them, I think that the conversation will go a different way. Because just screaming at them, hey, I want this, hasn't really worked anywhere for a very long time. Audience? I guess the same? Is anybody else? If you receive a free t-shirt, would you ask a question? Nobody wants free t-shirt? Okay. Uh, I would like to go to uh, the, uh, the evil thing. So, uh, it's very nice to have a choice. I believe that probably some of the guys here have think, thought about uh, evil thing and probably have nice, nice proof of concept. So, in my opinion, anybody who says I can do it, should be able to do it, and we as the voters should decide, should I choose this guy, or this guy, or this guy, or should I use the old-fashioned way? And in that matter, I would like to choose between uh, ways to vote. My, I personally believe that the remote voting should be implemented as soon as possible, but should not be mandatory. So. Everybody could make its choice. So this is more important, but if we don't start today, we won't have it tomorrow, right? So give us the choice. Don't, uh, don't tell us we don't believe in this, because when you as experts say, say this, it's a little bit discouraging. <laughs> so so if, you were to, if you were to take a cigarette and smoke right now, you couldn't do it here, right? Right. 
outside you can. And in certain places in the US, you couldn't even do it outside within like 50 meters or something of a, of a building. But is it your choice to do that? If you, if, if you were able to smoke in here, if it was 20 years ago or 10 years ago, I think it's just even 10 years ago, you could smoke in most restaurants, right? Right? But your choice is affecting everybody around you. And if e-voting gets hacked, because you and 10,000 people or 100,000 people made that choice, it's possible that your choice has affected the voting of everybody. But, but you made that choice. The cigarette makers chose to put nicotine and all kinds of crap in their stuff. It's not, it's, it's not exactly their fault, right? It is their fault, but it's not. You're the one that, that chose to take a cigarette and, and, and take a puff. But the mechanism, the mechanism that you're promoting, if it's not secure, affects everybody. Let's, let's not say it's not, it's not, it's impossible just because uh, it seems impossible. Let, let's see a proof that it's possible. This is what I'm saying. Well, uh, I, I don't accept a, an argument like this. Uh, we don't have it, so it's impossible. Let's see if it's impossible, and the guys who says it's possible, let them prove that this is... Am I missing the point? No, no, and I, 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 I respect your point fully about giving people a choice, and I think that's firm. If I, if I don't have confidence in an, uh, an electronic vote, then not let me use paper. But to your point that, hey, his choice to use uh, electronic voting, uh, and it's being potentially compromised, that applies to paper voting as well. Paper voting can be compromised, and it has been. So, to me, I think that's a new point. It can happen. Each method can be compromised, potentially. So, just prove out. You know, if we can prove out, you know, digital voting is fine. Yeah, but give people the choice, because I don't want to tell my mom or grandma that they don't have the confidence in electronic voting, but you have to use it. They still want to grasp that paper. That's important, is to give people the choice. Yeah, and to your other point, uh, don't, you know, we're, we're sitting up here saying it can't be done. I, I don't think that's what we're saying at all. I think what we're all trying to say is that at the point the technology is right now, and the way it's been implemented to this point, it's not safe. It's no safer than paper. And I have zero confidence in paper, so it's not like I'm trying to say that paper is better. I don't think we have a viable solution at the moment for this issue, and I think we should absolutely pursue it. I think blockchain is an interesting way to go. I think there are other technologies that we have yet to discover that as soon as one EUAI guy gets on it and gets that computer to write that for us, we'll be good to go. Write yourself out of a job. But until then, I think that's really how to focus on it. It's not that we're saying that this is a terrible idea, that we shouldn't go there, or you know, back to the point about how we could you know, hack one computer or influence one guy and then we can get to all this information. While it is more attainable, like Steve said, you know, I don't have to be within the, the area of that courthouse. At the same time, how many people did the KGB employ to go and get secrets from the Americans, right? I mean, they literally spent hundreds of thousands of hours of people and dollars to get in those points. So the game hasn't changed. It's just the way that we actually implement the actors and how the players actually go. But the game is the same, and we're still having a problem protecting those documents and keeping them safe. I agree that the users should get the choice. I think it's on the government's responsibility to make sure that if you are offered the choice, that the choice is safe. I think that if, you, if the government doesn't tell you anything, and electronic voting, for the sake of argument, is very unsafe and makes you vote against your own will, then I think it shouldn't exist as a choice. But assuming that both exist and both have flaws, I think you should get the choice. Yes? Wait, wait, one last one. question. Oh, question. Well, maybe one quick, with only one person answering. No, no, so, so <laughs> I, I actually was up, up here saying that I think e-voting can work, and I think the blockchain is probably one of the ways that it can work. Um, uh, do all of you trust your government? Do you want to leave the, de the decision to e-voting and things like that up to your government? 
I mean, I don't. Half, uh, half of the people that voted on our election voted in a moron. So, you know, I think the ways that we're, we're doing it now, there's, there's always ways to hack everything. I think I made that point early on that we're running against a race that we can't win. We can just get, hopefully, just a little bit farther ahead. And I don't think e-voting is there. I'd like to see good solutions. But um, given what's, what choices are out there today, I don't think you should be able to have that choice until we have something worthwhile to look at. Uh, I wasn't was clear in your uh, thoughts of Trump. Can you, uh... <laughs> can I say fucking moron? <laughs> People are making a lot of things to make the digitalization more secure. So uh, maybe in 20, 30 years, there may, might be a secure way to, to do the online voting. But what are people main doing nowadays to make the physical voting more secure? Because I don't think that the voting has changed for the last 10, 20 years. No, it's, it's still the same and we have the same physical security issues. And still the voting is getting compromised. One, one quick, quick question for me. Uh, it's like 10 years ago, we developed a voting system for a uh, nearly governmental organization, very small one, very traditional, with old people, accountants, like 7, 8 years old, and uh, it went smoothly. Uh, those uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen which were, uh, who were 7, 8 years old voted successfully. It was some standard uh, net shit, and uh, uh, it was anonymous. Everyone, every single one of the users had a uh, secret, secret uh, letter with uh, ID code, and later the results were published with those ID codes, and uh, only the guy with the ID code know, knew what uh, he voted, voted for, so the results couldn't be manipulated because someone would notice. And uh, on the other hand, nobody could know his neighbor what he voted for, right? And uh, of course, there is this uh, security issue. However, I'm sure every single one of you has money in the bank, and uh, more or less, you use PayPal and eBay and stuff like that. And uh, you, every day, you have, you are at risk with being compromised. However, you use it. And one more thing, as a community, we can uh, stay strong and uh, defend this eventual voting system, which will live for like one day until everybody votes for one day. So we did, we've done uh, greater things before. So I'm sure we can uh, make sure that uh, one stupid system lives for one day without being compromised. And if an uh, eight-year-old lady can vote, then every single one of us has the capacity to do it, right? Uh, just uh, some thoughts on that and that, that's it, thanks. Uh, redefinition of uh, short question, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs>